So we're looking at support of why the normative rules of language context and logic must, must be applied. And if they are not, we went through A, B, C, D, and E points otherwise. Otherwise, men are of accountable age capacity, complete ignorance. B, otherwise God would have conspired to restrict the knowledge. C, if the normative rules aren't used, then God would have deliberately confused mankind by permitting multiple false interpretations. And D, otherwise the Bible is made subject to whatever rules of interpretation you, you can dream up. With the aid of the devil, he's a genius. He's not as smart as God, but he's a genius compared to us. And we'll give you led astray. Don't do that. And E, the word of God can be interpreted by how the individual chooses to apply the words to himself. Personal interpretation. And finally we get to F. Big warnings here. And this is the way Christian denominations are acting today. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit is not involved in the interpretation of the Bible. He's the, he's the inspirer of it. Actually, the author of it through human authors. Any interpretation that is a violation of the normative rules of language, context, and logic indicates that the Holy Spirit, the source of every word in the Bible, is not involved in that interpretation. Therefore, that particular interpretation is not communication from God. Subjective methods of interpretation, which by nature are driven by the devil, the world, and the sin nature will inevitably differ from the Bible and add private interpretations to the objective normative method, thereby contradicting it, causing error and confusion relative to the Bible. This is a valid result. This is, this is a result which violates the character of communication from God. Hence, the method is not a valid means to interpret the Bible, what the Bible says, or to compare with the Bible. So any interpretation of the Bible which violates these rules normative rules, could not be what God intended it to communicate. Just as God's sovereignty prevailed over man's penship of the 66 books of the Bible and produced an inerrant work by the hand of man, so he sovereignly prevailed over the languages of men, which they used so that what man has established as normative use is what is reflected in his word, so that all men of a cannibal age and linguistic capacity by learning as you grow up your own native language to read and write, might be able to choose to understand man, God's revelation to man. Point seven. Neither an individual's feelings, nor his experiences, nor his interpretation of his feelings and experiences can override, add to, supplant, or modify what the Bible normatively interprets says. So, when you believe with your heart, that's a little more, suggesting a little of, of emotional content, perseverance, but you don't have to believe with your heart because that's a figurative of speech. You're doing it with some enthusiasm. But if you believe it without that enthusiasm, it's nevertheless a belief. It's according to the dictionary use. I believe this rather is nice outside. I may just matter of fact say that. San Diego, we have a lot of nice days. I don't get all juiced up about it all the time. Uh, and, uh, but if, if I just do it, believe it matter-of-factly, it's just as good as a belief, because believing is just accepting is true. So, neither an individual's feeling nor his experiences, nor his interpretation of his feelings or experiences can override, add to, supplant, or modify what the Bible normatively interpreted says. So I said, people go, well, I think, and I stopped it right there, it doesn't matter what you think, or I feel, it doesn't matter what you feel, what do the words say? whether you like it or not. Experiences and feelings may be real, but they are too often misinterpreted due to insufficient evidence, jumping to false conclusions, stereotypical prejudices, perspectives which are unbiblical. Deep within each individual is a sin nature, which can be influenced by the devil in the world, causing them within one a propensity to think, say, and do wrong, which affects each individual's interpretation of what is true and righteous. A little bit of humility and directive and, dis and careful honesty and detail. That's what's needed. Not a lot of emotionalism. Suggested routines, point eight, and resources to arrive at the normative meaning of the Bible of a passage or a chapter in the Bible. A determining the word, uh, the wording of a passage, a chapter of the Bible that is closest to the original text, you must follow the normative rules of language, context, and logic, one verse at a time, in the order that it appears. 
If you're in chapter 2, have you mastered chapter 1 yet? If you had verse 8 in chapter 2, you should have mastered those verses in chapter 1 and the first seven verses in chapter 2. Take notes relative to variants in the original language from one or more interlinear Bibles of the original language aided by one or more commentaries on the original Greek. I love expositors. They do that a lot. And I have the uh, commentary. i show it to you here. The New Translation, New Testament Text and Translation Commentary. Thick book. New Testament gives you all the manuscript evidence, the significant ones, and it gives you the reasons why one manuscript evidence should be over another. Usually, the earliest manuscripts have it correctly, and also usually the short and sweet rather than the long and drawn out passages. Take notes relative to these variants in the original language from one or more interlinear Bibles of the original language, aided by one or more commentaries of the original Greek text, and one or more books on the subject of Bible difficulties. Resources. I've listed some resources here. Complete Biblical Library. Excellent. It gives you some manuscript evidence as well in the book I just showed you. Now we move on down and make a list of the variants for a verse, including which manuscripts have each variant and the proposed reasons offered for selecting one variant over another. Consult the Bible Difficulties book. You have to see if they, are any, if they offer any information on the verses with variances. Also, check out what I just showed you, the New Testament text, original text, and translation commentary. Goes in a lot of detail. Most of the time it's not that significant, but sometimes it is. For example, look at John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one only son, whosoever believes in him should never perish but have everlasting life. That's the English translation. And they say, well, believes, that's present tense. That means you have to keep on believing to keep on having eternal life. Well, let's look at, uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and then not of yourselves, gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Well, in John 3.16 is, whoever is the believing one, paho pastorian, literally, and that should be translated. I've never seen it translated. And then Ephesians 2, 8, 9, which I just quoted, it's by grace you have been saved. King James Version says, by grace you are saved. Well, that means you are saved if you have an ongoing faith. John three sixteen. whoever is believing. Uh, as you're believing, then you're saved. If you stop believing, like you go and take a nap and don't think of a pizza and your dreams, you don't have salvation? No. And so that's the careful examination of good translations and original text. Write down, point three, write down what you have determined is the closest to the original text with the English wording for each verse with variants in 21st century American English that best fits the language, context, and logic of that verse. You start reading in King James Version to make sure you have a very, very, very good knowledge of that language because there's some archaic words there that we don't know the meaning for unless you study, uh, like with Shakespeare and his uh, writings, his plays. Point three, write down what you have determined is the closest to the original text with the English wording for each verse, with variants in 21st century American English that best fits the language, context, and logic in that verse. If there were point four, there still remains a significant difference in the variant text so that you cannot be definitive on what the original text might be, present the various possibilities based on the internal evidence of the passage without making a decision for one or the other. And ask around. This is not disastrous because the Bible repeats itself all the time relative to the doctrine to the faith. So missing a doctrinal message in one passage, one can be assured that that doctrine will be more clearly available elsewhere in the scriptures. The better skilled you become at this and the better your resources, the fewer such passages will be a problem for you. More often than not, the context of the passage carefully considered will rule in favor of one variant or another, or the variants do not make a difference in the meaning of, of the passage. B. Arrive at a translation in 21st century English of a passage or chapter of the Bible which best reflects the original text by following the normative rules of language, context, and logic. The rules don't change. The language changes. 
and the grammar changes. But you're investigating the language grammar of that particular language and not imposing it on another language. So to do this, you compare a passage to chapter of the Bible in the interlinear Bible of the original language, including those verses with variant problems, which you have already resolved, with at least seven versions or translations in English in order to select the version as modified by you, which best reflects the original text in 21st century English by following the normative rules of language, context, and logic. I say 21st century English because we're in the 21st century and I speak English. Now, if you speak French or German, uh, I, I would suggest you get a good translation in those languages. So make your own modifications in brackets to comply with these rule, rules of interpretation. Each of the seven plus versions, I use seven, you choose to use, should have been translated largely in accordance with the normative rules, avoiding paraphrases, substituted words, and restructuring sentences whenever linguistically possible in the English language. Many versions are available online. You can check, a, check this link. The versions you choose to compare with the interlinear should include a number of versions which are noted for their literal translation and a number that attempt to be faithful to the word order of the original text, such as the Young's literal translation, authorized version, and the King James version, which they do both. These three versions have, and others have archaic words which need to be corrected to 21st century English by consulting an archaic English dictionary available online and or comparing them to 21st century English versions. Archaic words often have significantly different meanings than what the same word means in today's English. Also trustworthy are the following versions in 21st century English, NASB, New King's Age Version, and like twin sisters, very close to one another, Holman Standard, and the NIV. Now, NIV is a paraphrase, and Holman Standard does the same thing, uh, a little bit less paraphrasing and more like the NASB and the New King's Age version. It is available online in PDF format. Select the most accurate version. Translation is modified by you from amongst those seven plus versions and translations. The version translation you select and modify from the group of versions you are comparing to, the interlinear Bible, original text, to represent an a translation in English of the original text each verse should, and I'm going to stop a second and go to this, and show you what my interlinear looks like. It's not hard. I have it in four window panels. I narrow it down to usually two. Um, let's take John 3.16, because that has some sub substantive differences. Uh, here's John 3.16. We'll take out the dictionary for the moment and the commentaries for the moment. Look at John 3.16. Okay, here's the interlinear. Thus for love, the God, the world, he so loved the world that the Son, his only unique one, only begotten is not accurate, actually. Let's see, let's check, check the dictionary on that. Uh, what i got to do is go up here and click on that and then go to the dictionary. Here it is. Only. Unique. Only begotten. Unique is there. Because we're begotten of God in the sense of being born again children of God. Jesus Christ is unique. The one and only. And let me go on down to God so loved the world that he gave his one only son implied is for your sins that everyone the believing one so it's not whoever or every every whoever believes an ongoing present tense which even present tense isn't ongoing it depends upon the context may not perish may not because God is faithful and he will make sure you don't perish, but may have life eternal. What present, what's the tense? Present tense. You may have. So you start believing, you have present tense possession. It doesn't say, but will have at the end of your life. It doesn't clarify, see. So 
So now we have an insight into some of the things people say that you have to keep on believing in order to keep on having eternal